So I am so happy to be here tonight. I was very happy to be asked. I was asked to get to give this talk because I'm the author of a book that came out about a year ago now. I can't believe it's been that long called Flight Paths about the history and the science behind how we know what we know about bird migration. So I spent several years of my life immersed in this topic. I read more scientific papers than I could possibly count. I talked to dozens of scientists, not only ornithologists, but a surprising number of electrical engineers and computer scientists, folks like that. I got to join a few of the ornithologists in the field while they were carrying out their research. And I feel really privileged that this is my job, this is what I do for work, and that I get to tell the stories of some of the scientists profiled in this book. I still feel like they're the real experts, and I'm just here trying to bring the amazing things that they're doing to a wider audience. And it's a really fun job to have because really there are so many good stories to tell about bird migration. These are just a few of the amazing migrators whose stories appear in my book. On the left, that is the bar-tailed godwit. This bird makes the longest known nonstop bird migration in the world. In the fall, they fly from Alaska all the way across the Pacific Ocean without touching down to get to their wintering range around New Zealand. In the middle is the bar-headed goose. These birds make what is probably the highest altitude bird migration in the world, flying over the tops of the Himalayan mountains every year. And in the upper right-hand corner, that little guy is called a black pole warbler. These birds, what they do in fall to get from New England down to their wintering grounds in Northern South America, they launch themselves out and spend about three days flying over the open waters of the Atlantic Ocean, which sounds less impressive than the bar-tailed godwit crossing the whole width of the Pacific, but a godwit is about the size of a football and a black hole warbler is about the size, weighs about the same as a ballpoint pen. So it's just incredible. But for me, what fascinates me just as much as what migrating birds do and how they do it is how we figured all of this out. That's what my book is really about, and that's what I'm here to talk a little bit about tonight. Before I, I dive into that, I want to give just a little bit more background about me and how I came to write this book. So before COVID, I had a full-time job working for the American Ornithological Society as their one person communications department. This is the big professional or professional organization in the US for scientists who study birds. They give out research grants, they put on an annual scientific conference, and they also publish two peer reviewed scientific journals, which are what you see here. This is where scientists write up and publish their new discoveries. And I wore a lot of hats as a one person communications department. But one of the big parts of my job was promoting the new research being published here to science journalists and to the public. So I was reading a lot of papers, scientific papers. And I don't know how many of you viewing this this evening are familiar with the formats of a scientific paper, but they all follow the same basic structure. They start with the introduction where the researchers lay out what question they were trying to answer and why. And then there's the methods where they go step-by-step step through the procedure that they used for their study. And then there's the results and the discussion where they talk about what they found and why it matters and where we might go from here. And I was reading all these papers and I kept getting sucked into the part that I think a lot of people skim over quickly to get to the good stuff, which is the methods section. I didn't know that you can study bird migration using weather radar. You can study bird migration by putting out microphones to passively record the calls of birds passing overhead at night. You can study bird migration by analyzing rare hydrogen isotopes in bird feathers. I'm not even gonna get into that this evening, but it's wild. And so I started thinking, how did we figure all of this out and who figured it out and how does it even work? And so I ended up leaving that job around the start of the pandemic, and I decided to write a book proposal. 
So this is the table of contents of the book. Basically, what I did was I just tackled each of the major methods that have been used to figure out bird migration one chapter at a time, beginning with bird banding, which was developed way back in the early years of the 20th century, and going all the way up through the latest high-tech advances like high-volume genetic sequencing and things like that. Um, so I cover a lot of ground, but when I thought about how I might adapt this into a 45-minute talk, give or take, I decided that since there was no way I was going to be able to cram all of this in, the most fun thing to do would be to zoom in on three of my favorite stories from the book. So that's what I'm going to do this evening. I'm going to tell you about three of my favorite migration innovators who I learned about doing my research. And my hope is that you will come away from this evening with a new appreciation of all of the hard work and creativity that went into uncovering every gee whiz fact that you might hear about bird migration. Excuse me. So the first tactic for figuring out what migratory birds are doing that I want to talk about is one that I had not even heard of before I started doing the research for this book, and that is called moon watching. So most birds, or at least most songbirds, actually migrate at night. They're making most of their progress at night and resting during the day. And that means that if you want to know what these migrating birds are doing, you need to get kind of creative to see what they're up to. Not because not only are they flying pretty high up, but it's also dark. So you can't just look up and see them. Today, we have all sorts of high-tech tools like radar, and which I'm going to get to, and satellite telemetry to help us spy on these night migrating birds. But before any of that technology was developed, this guy, whose name was George Lowry, came up with a really clever way to do it using just a telescope. George Lowry was born in Louisiana in 1913, and he was obsessed with birds from the time that he was a child. He finished his master's degree from the University of Louisiana in Baton Rouge in 1936, and he stayed on there for the rest of his career as an instructor and an ornithologist, and he founded LSU's Museum of Zoology, which still exists today. Now, being really, really into birds, and living right along the Gulf Coast, George Lowry would have been very familiar with a phenomenon called migratory fallout. So this is when birds in spring, when they're migrating north, they often cross the Gulf of Mexico. And then depending on the weather conditions, they sometimes all just sort of fall out of the sky on mass at the, when, at the first bit of land that they encounter. So when conditions are just right, if you're in, you know, the first little growth of trees back behind the beach, you can just see every variety of migratory songbird imaginable dripping from the branches. And although there wasn't really any way to prove it at the time, a lot of ornithologists in the early 20th century, George Lowry included, thought, based on circumstantial evidence like migratory fallout, that it was likely that migrating birds crossed over the open water of the Gulf of Mexico on a regular basis. So this route was just a normal part of the annual bird migration. But then in the 1940s, another biologist named George Williams, they're both named George, I'm sorry, it was a popular name for mid-century ornithologists. So George number two, George Williams, he comes along and says, hang on, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Why would these birds voluntarily choose to fly over hundreds of miles of open water when Mexico is right there. Basically, he said, you guys, I, I know no one sees a lot of these birds in Mexico, but we just must not be looking hard enough. They must be going that way because it's the only thing that makes sense. Now, George Lowry, who again had seen the evidence of trans-Gulf migration with his own eyes, was really annoyed about this and really determined to prove George Williams wrong. And so he started thinking about how he might gather concrete evidence that large scale trans Gulf migration was a real phenomenon. And he remembered some quirky ornithology papers from the early years of the 20th century, where some folks had described looking at the full moon through a telescope during migration and being able to see the silhouettes of these night migrating birds passing in front of the moon. 
And Lowry thought, well, that's interesting. Maybe I can do something with that. Luckily for him, there was an astronomer also working at LSU at this time who happened to be also an avid birder. And so Lowry and this astronomer put their heads together and they came up with a set of equations that would let Lowry take a raw count of how many birds passed in front of the moon in a certain amount of time and do some math and turn that into an estimate of the total number of birds crossing an imaginary one mile line on the Earth's surface every hour. Now, th this sounds kind of abstract and it is, but what it boils down to is Lowry now had a tool to measure and quantitatively compare how much migration was happening in one time and place with how much migration was happening in another time and place, which sounds really simple, but there had never been a good way to do that before. So Lowry dubbed this the migration traffic rate, and he thought that it meant he finally had a tool to demonstrate the volume of birds passing over the Gulf. All right, so April 1945, Lowry packs up a telescope, he gets on a boat, headed across the Gulf of Mexico for a port on the Yucatan Peninsula, and he's so excited. He's like, here I go. I'm going to prove George number two wrong. First night, he goes up on deck, sets up his telescope. They're, you know, out at sea in the Gulf, and he points it at the moon. George Lowry did not have any experience on the water. He had failed to anticipate the fact that when he put his eye up to the eyepiece, the moon would be bobbing in and out of sight with the waves, the action of the waves, making it impossible to get a good count of birds. But Lowry was not a man who gave up easily. He knew that there must be thousands of birds streaming overhead in, in the darkness. And so he waited until the boat docked in the Yucatan where the waters were calmer and he tried again. He pointed his telescope out at the moon rising over the Gulf and in 45 minutes, he tallied 12 birds, which might not sound like much, but when he did the math, this worked out to more than 3,700 birds passing over an imaginary one mile line extending out into the Gulf every hour. Lowry just collected the first hard numerical evidence that trans-Gulf migration was real. So take that, George, number two. Now, Lowry knew that he was onto something big. He was just getting started. His next idea for moon watching was to scale it up and recruit volunteers from across North America to help collect this type of data. Today, we would call this citizen science or community science. And there's a whole chapter in my book just on that. In the 1940s and 50s, though, those terms hadn't been coined yet. Lowry just knew that he had hit on a method that had the potential to reveal migration patterns at the scale of the whole continent for the first time. But he was not going to be able to carry out such a big project alone. And luckily for Lowry, an enthusiastic young graduate student named Bob Newman arrived at the Museum of Zoology right about this time. So this is Lowry again on the left, Bob Newman on the right. This is clearly not Bob Newman as an enthusiastic young graduate student. Uh, you'll have to use your imagination because in the pre-smartphone era, people often didn't get a lot of photos taken of themselves until they were further along in their career and more famous. Now, like Lowry, Bob Newman came as a grad student and ended up staying on at LSU for the rest of his career. And these two men formed a working partnership that lasted all the way until Lowry's death in the 1970s. They both passed away decades ago, so I did not get to interview either of these men when I was working on my book. But I did get to talk to an ornithologist now in his 80s who worked with both of them when he was a grad student at LSU. He shared some of his recollections. And my impression is that in a lot of ways, these two men could not have been more different. They were sort of the odd couple of ornithology. Lowry on the left was an old school gentleman naturalist who wore a suit and tie for field work and organized expeditions into the jungle to gather new specimens for his museum. He was a workaholic who would go home to eat dinner with his wife only to sneak back to the office to get a few more hours of work in in the evening. Bob Newman on the right was a jokester. He had a reputation for his sense of humor, but he also approached problems a lot more like a modern scientist. Newman taught himself statistics 
before that was a common skill for zoologists. You didn't need to know stats to be a zoologist in the 1940s and 50s. And he made it a personal mission to keep up with the latest bird migration research being published all over the world. So together, these two men came up with a plan to collect a snapshot of migration activity across the entire continent during a single week in October. No one had ever tried anything like this before. This was before the internet. It was basically before computers. There might have been a few primitive computers in the US at this time, but these two guys sure did not have access to them. So to, to pull this off, they literally spent up to 12 hours a day handwriting personal letters to hundreds of potential volunteers all over the continent, explaining the goals of the project and what would be required of data collectors and the special contribution that they would be making to science. And they eventually recruited 2,500 volunteers in 325 locations from Canada all the way down to Panama. And they wanted to make sure that the, the data that their volunteers collected was high quality. So they even printed up a how-to pamphlet to mail off to everyone who had signed up and included some tips on keeping yourself comfortable during long stints of staring up at the sky. Now I mentioned, this is an actual, this is an actual figure from one of their how-to pamphlets. I mentioned that Bob Newman was known for his sense of humor. So I cannot decide if this picture was meant to be kind of funny or if it was just the 50s, but I, I really like the cigar and the, and the pants, it's pretty fun. So finally, in fall 1952, telescopes swung into action across North America. Local bird watchers all over the country looked up at the moon and did their counts. And pretty soon, paper data sheets were flooding in from every corner of the continent, stacking up higher, and higher and higher on Lowry and Newman's desks. And they realized that they had another problem, which is what to do with all that data. Like they, they probably should have thought of this more beforehand. No computers. This was before most zoologists even had any training in statistics. They now needed to calculate the average direction and volume of bird migration from each of these hundreds of locations. They needed to look up data on temperature and wind and the movement of cold fronts for each of those locations because they wanted to look for connections with weather patterns and like, you know, look it up in printed books of weather records for the country. And they needed to depict all of this on easy to interpret maps, which they would have to draw by hand. It took them 14 years. Finally, in 1966, their magnum opus appeared in the ornithological journal, The Auk, coincidentally one of the same journals that I would work for about five decades later. They titled it A Continent-Wide View of Bird Migration on Four Nights in October. And it included these painstakingly crafted maps where they had used arrows colored red and black and white to indicate the volume as well as the direction of migration at locations across the continent on the nights of October 1st through 4th, 1952. In the Midwest and East, you could see these massive migratory flights that spans multiple states with reports from a lot of locations that were remarkably consistent on how many birds were passing over and their precise heading. And you can see that favorable winds and the movement of cold fronts both clearly affected migration patterns across the continent with the heaviest migration occurring in front of advancing cold fronts. I feel like today when we're so used to seeing satellite imagery of the earth and stuff, it's almost hard to wrap our minds around how new this must have seemed at this point in time. No one had ever done anything like this before. No, this was the first time anyone had been able to see the patterns of bird migration at the scale of the entire continent. This paper was 40 pages long. It was a blockbuster. It influenced studies of migration for years. It was also the last moon watching paper that Lowry and Newman would ever publish because all of this hard work was about to be made pretty much obsolete by the rise of the new technology, which was radar. So I'm sure some of you have seen an image like this before. This was taken from the nationwide weather radar system, the same one that you see 
images from on the Weather Channel with the green and orange blobs to show you where the rainstorms are. And you can see some rain on this map, especially along the East Coast. But all of those round blobs down the middle of the continent are birds. So they generally filter migrating birds and any other distractions out of the radar images that they use for TV weather reports. But birds actually show up really well on radar. And during migration, as big waves of birds move across the continent, when they lift off the dust, there's so many of them in the air that they can just completely saturate the field of view of a radar station. So each of those round blobs is just the area of view of one single radar station. But when people first started using radar in a big way, it hadn't occurred to anyone yet that they might pick up birds. They weren't looking for birds. They weren't looking for rainstorms either. They were looking for Nazi planes. So radar, of course, first came into widespread use in World War II. And to get a tiny bit technical just for a minute, radar stands for radio detection and ranging. And the way that it works is a special transmitter beams out radio waves. And as those waves bounce off of objects in their path, some of their energy is reflected back to the radar equipment. And how much energy comes back and the angle that it comes in at tells you something about the size and distance of any objects that are out there. You can think of it as being like sonar or echolocation, but with radio waves instead of sound. British scientists had worked out all the basic principles of this in the 1930s. And by the time World War II officially broke out, they had built radar stations up and down the British coast to detect incoming planes from the mainland. But pretty much as soon as these radar stations were operational, they started picking up some weird signals that they had not been expecting. So planes usually kind of plot along at a consistent speed and in trajectory when you're looking at them at the scale of radar. But they were seeing these weird little blips that waxed and waned and changed direction at random. Supposedly at one point a red alert was sounded and British fighter planes were urgently ordered into the air to intercept these strange signals over the English Channel only to get up into the sky and find nothing there. And the exasperated radar operators started calling these mystery signals radar angels. You see where this is going. All right, so while all this was going on, this guy, whose name was David Lack, had been teaching science at a secondary school in Devonshire in southwestern England. And he did not know it yet, but he was about to become the father of radar ornithology. Black had always been interested in birds. He had studied ornithology when he was at Cambridge. And in 1938, he took a year off from his teaching job to travel to the Galapagos Islands to study Darwin's famous finches. He got back to the UK just as war was breaking out. And David Black later wrote a short memoir, memoir about the early years of his career. So I wanna to read to you just a little bit in David Black's own words about what he arrived or what happened when he arrived back in England on the brink of war. I had become a pacifist at the age of 17. He'd signed a pledge to an anti-war organization. And in the autumn of 1940, I decided that I ought to leave my job at the school to work with a pacifist unit. I spent a trial night in the east end of London during heavy raids, but was so put off by the pacifists' earnest attitudes and so excited by the flashes and bangs that I was immediately converted from pacifism. A month later, the Central Register for Scientific Workers sent me to interview for an unspecified job. As a biologist, you will of course have learned a lot of physics, the interviewer said. I'm afraid not, I answered. Well, I expect your maths is of a high standard. I'm afraid not. Then, very doubtfully, I fear this job will often entail going out in the wet and cold in the dark. Would you mind that? Not at all. So I was taken on and 10 days later set off from London with 19 other biologists on a mystery coach tour. It's always fun to discover that the historical person you're researching had a sense of humor. So yeah, you can see where this is going. Lack was assigned to a job working on radar systems. He was first posted to the Orkneys, which are a wet, windy, remote group of islands off the north end of Scotland. I gather that David Lack was just about the only person happy 
to be sent there because the birding was really good. He got to spend his off hours looking for puffins and skuas climbing around over the rocks. But shortly after that, he was reintroduced to an old acquaintance of his from Cambridge named George Farley, or third George of the evening, the last one, I promise. Again, it was a popular name for mid-century biologists. Now, as I said, Varley was a classmate of Lax from Cambridge, and he had been an entomologist before the war, so a bug guy. But now he had also fallen into this line of work working on radar systems as part of the war effort. It was Varley who introduced Lack to the mystery of the angels plaguing the radar operators. Now, David Lack was an ornithologist by training. He was familiar with the behavior of birds in flight. And he pretty much immediately was like, guys, it's birds. No one believed him at first. Excuse me. So Lack and Varley got pretty creative trying to prove this. Um, at one point, they actually convinced an officer to, die, to tie a dead gull to a balloon and send it up into the air in front of a radar station just to demonstrate that it was at least possible for a bird to produce a radar signal. Finally, in September 1941, Varley managed to use a powerful telescope to confirm that the source of the signal being tracked offshore in real time was in fact a flock of gannets, the seabird that you see here. As the war continued, Lack and Varley continued to collect radar observations that they believed represented birds. And at first only big birds like gannets and geese were showing up, but radar technology was improving rapidly and soon they were detecting flocks of smaller birds like starlings. Um, they continued to gather more and more data to confirm that the characteristics of the so-called angels were consistent with the behavior of birds in flight. It took them a while to convince everyone. I want to read one more brief David Lack quote, just because I love this man's sense of humor. At one meeting, he wrote, after the physicists had again greatly explained that clouds of ions must be responsible, Varley, with equal gravity, accepted their view, providing that the ions were wrapped in feathers. So they stuck with it. And in 1945, as the end of the war neared, they got permission to publish their previously top secret findings in the journal Nature. Today, Lack, who died in 1973, is better remembered for a book that he wrote about Darwin's finches, but this publication essentially kicked off the whole subdiscipline now known as radar ornithology. Now, radar ornithology might have been a footnote in my book instead of an entire chapter if radar hadn't turned out to be really useful for another group of folks besides the Air Force and ornithologists. And that, of course, was meteorologists. So pretty much immediately after the war, weather scientists started developing radar technology as a way to provide early warnings about hurricanes and other major storms. Large flocks of birds showed up just as well on weather radar as they had on military radar. So building a nationwide network of radar systems was great news for ornithologists interested in large scale migration patterns. And over time, as this technology has advanced and we've gotten things like Doppler technology, it's just continued to be a better and better source of information about the patterns of large scale migration. So I wanna talk really briefly about a specific paper that was published in 2018 that I think shows the power of this kind of data. Uh, two scientists working with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology downloaded radar scans covering every evening for 23 years this is more than 150,000 total individual radar scans. And they analyzed them to see how weather factors like temperature and wind and air pressure predicted the appearance of big migration movements on radar. Because we think of migration as being, you know, a season lasting a month or more, but there's not an equal number of birds in the sky every night. There's big nights and there's quiet nights, depending on the conditions. Oh, and if you're paying attention, you might notice this is basically the same thing that uh, Lowry and Newman were trying to do with moon watching, but now we have much bigger data sets and we have supercomputers to help us analyze them. So when they did the math here, they found that by using this analysis, they could explain almost 80% of the variation in how much 
migration was going on from one night to the next by looking at these weather patterns, and that they could even predict big migratory movements several days in advance. So there's this really tool, really tool cool, really cool tool called BirdCast that is operated by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. You can log on to this website during migration, and it will give you a forecast of how many birds will be flying overhead in your area that night. And this is the technology that this tool is based on. And it is all thanks to a witty science teacher from Devonshire who realized what must really be going on with those mysterious so-called angels. But of course, radar is not the only way to put radio waves to work tracking birds. And that brings me to my third and last and favorite story of the evening. All right. So this guy's name is Bill Cochran. We have young Bill Cochran on the left, Bill Cochran later in his career on the right. In the mid 1950s, Bill Cochran was a young Navy veteran working on an electrical engineering degree part-time while working for a brand new television station based in Champaign, Illinois. Ah, sorry about that. <laughs> One morning, he went to check on his employer's transmitter tower on the outskirts of town. And when he pulled up, there was a guy there picking up dead birds off the ground. Cochran was intrigued and started peppering the man with questions. It turns out that his name was Richard Graber and he was an ornithologist from the University of Illinois who was studying a phenomenon called tower kills where flocks of birds fly into communications towers and are killed by the impact. Cochran was really intrigued by this guy and his bird research. I imagine Cochran might not have known that studying birds was a career option. And pretty soon, Cochran was spending his spare time tinkering together gadgets to help Richard Graeber in his work. Bill Cochran appears in more chapters of my book than any other single person. The first project that he and Graeber worked on together was I mentioned briefly at the beginning the, the calls that birds make as they pass overhead at night. They make these unique calls that they don't make at any other time. Cochran and Graeber were the, fir the first folks to make recordings of these calls. And one of my favorite little anecdotes from the entire book is Bill Cochran figuring out how to rig up a tape recorder with bicycle axles to hold these 6,000 feet of tape that they would need to record an entire night. This is their recording setup there. But by far the chapter in my book where Bill Cochran looms largest is the one on radio telemetry. So telemetry just means transmitting data from one place to another in real time. And there were two technological advances right around this time that really helped kick off the field of radio telemetry. The first was the invention of the transistor in 1947. I don't know if you can read the caption there, but this is a replica of the first transistor. And to take a subject that's pretty technical and just boil it down to the bare essentials, before this, radios relied on bulky, breakable vacuum tubes to amplify the signals that they were sending out. But transistors, provided a lightweight, efficient, durable way of doing the same thing. And as a result, they made it possible to suddenly adapt radios for all sorts of tasks that they wouldn't have been suited for before, including transmitting sensitive data from place to place in real time. One of the first groups to actually jump on this and start experimenting it with this was the US Navy. They tried things like using radio signals to transmit real-time data on a jet pilot's vital signs to a position monitoring them from the ground, and to study the effectiveness of cold water suits for sailors by transmitting out real-time temperature data. It did not take long for wildlife researchers to begin borrowing these same techniques. Excuse me. So in 1957, some scientists in Antarctica used the system from the cold water suit tests to remotely monitor the temperature of a penguin egg during incubation. That's what's going on here. Those are penguins being manhandled in the lower right-hand corner. And 
That same year, a group of researchers in Maryland borrowed some ideas from the Jet Pilot Project and surgically implanted transmitters in woodchucks to monitor their movements around the Little Nature Preserve. Soon, big engineering firms like Honeywell were getting involved, trying to design radio tracking systems that they could sell to wildlife biologists to use to track animals' movements. But they were trying things like strapping a metal box containing a radio transmitter to the back of a grouse uh, and then releasing the bird into the bushes. And a grouse, a game bird with a metal box strapped to its back does not last very long in the wild. So before, before wildlife telemetry could really take off, someone was literally going to have to think outside the box. And that someone turned out to be Bill Cochran. So I said two technological advances, and I only talked about one, the transistor so far. The other one was Sputnik. So this is Sputnik 1, which was launched in 1957. This was, of course, the first artificial satellite launched by the Soviets. Basically, all this thing did was circle the Earth and beep. But if you had a radio receiver and you knew what you were doing, you could pick up this beep from anywhere on planet Earth. And this just touched off a whole new wave of fascination with radios and what they could do. So by 1960, Bill Cochran, who still had not actually finished his electrical engineering degree, but was apparently something of a transistor savant, if you will, had picked up more part-time work helping a University of Illinois astronomer build radio beacons for some of the first US satellites that were going to be launched in response to Sputnik. Actually, some of the first US spy satellites, but Cochrane and the astronomer did not know that that's what they were working on. Cochrane was also still doing work with Raver and his colleagues at the Illinois Natural History Survey. And it didn't take too long before someone there suggested combining Cochrane's two part time gigs. Like, hey, Bill, what do you think would happen if we took one of your radio gizmos and put it on a duck? I don't know. Sounds fun. Let's try it. So they sent over a duck from the field station on the Illinois River, and they strapped a radio transmitter onto this, bird's, onto this bird using a metal band that went over its chest. And although they had not really planned this, it turned out that the bird's breathing distorted the band in a way that affected the radio signal, so that when they released the duck, they could track its respiratory rate as it flew accidentally collecting some of the first data on the, the physiology of a bird in flight. So the moment that duck took off with one of his transmitters attached to it, Bill Cochran was hooked and this became the focus of the whole rest of his career. He didn't just work on birds. Um, I think we're all familiar with wildlife telemetry, like the radio collars worn by deer and wolves and stuff. It pretty much all goes back to Bill Cochran. He was the first guy to make this really practical. Building a radio transmitter to be worn by an animal requires making trade-offs among a long list of factors. A longer antenna will give you a stronger signal. A bigger battery will give you a longer lasting device, but those both add weight. And Cochran, who wouldn't officially finish that engineering degree for several more years, turned out to be really good at getting this balance just right. He favored designs that were as small and simple and compact as possible. And instead of putting the components in a metal box, he came up with this idea of dipping the whole assembly in plastic resin to seal and waterproof everything together. Now, when he first started, he was working on things like um, surveying cottontail rabbits, but it did not take very long until he was bu building transmitters small enough that they could safely be placed on large songbirds. This was great news because his old friend and mentor, Richard Graber, studied large migratory songbirds. He studied thrushes, and he was looking for ways to learn more about their migratory behavior. So, 1965, Richard Graber, Cochran's ornithologist friend, manages to find a pilot who was willing to try following a migrating radio tagged thrush at night via a small plane, because these devices only had a range of a few miles. So if you wanted to use one to follow a migrating bird, you literally had to follow the migrating bird. May 1965, they captured a gray cheek thrush outside Urbana, Illinois. They trimmed the feathers from a little patch on its back. 
and they stuck on the transmitter using eyelash glue, the same stuff that we use to attach false eyelashes. This is actually still very popular for this sort of thing because it's non-toxic and it doesn't irritate the skin and it wears off on its own eventually. So you can just enjoy the, the mental image of generations of crusty macho wildlife biologists having to learn exactly where the eyelash glue is kept at the local cosmetic store. Side note, sorry. So that night, Graber and the pilot followed this bird north for 400 miles before turning back, 200 of which were over the open water of Lake Michigan. They wouldn't have been able to see the bird. They were just flying through the night in the darkness, listening to the wavering beep, beep, beep of the transmitter in the cockpit of the plane and imagining the bird out there somewhere in front of them. Graber, the ornithologist, was so awed by this experience that when he later wrote about it for Audubon magazine, he compared it to how he felt watching the TV coverage of the Apollo moon missions. And Bill Cochran was just getting started. I think someone, if they wanted to, could fill a whole book just with Bill Cochran stories. But just to give you one more, in 1973, Cochran and a student named Charles Welling tagged another thrush passing through Illinois in the spring. And this time they spent a full week following this bird almost a thousand miles all the way across the Canadian border and up into Manitoba in a station wagon with a hole cut in the top for their radio receiver. At one point, uh, the kid who was going along to help drive basically had to spend a night in jail when a, when a suspicious police officer pulled them over in rural Minnesota. I mean, who wouldn't be suspicious seeing this thing drive through your rural Minnesota town in the middle of the night? Uh, Cochran didn't want to stop for more than a minute or two because he was worried he would lose the bird. So he basically kicked the student out of the car to sort things out, kept going, waited until the bird set down at dawn and he knew where it was going to rest for the day, doubled back, bailed welling out and on they went. Because they were able to stick with this bird over such a long distance, gathering data on you know its altitude, its airspeed and ground speed, the distance it was covering, etc., they were actually able to track how the precise direction that the bird sat out in each night changed as its position changed relative to magnetic north. And this provided some of the first uh, real world evidence that migrating songbirds use some sort of internal magnetic compass as one of their tools for navigation. They were finally forced to stop when the car's engine gave out after they crossed into Canada. Now Cochran was kind of a crotchety guy. I don't think he was the easiest person to work with or get along with. He was married three times, if that tells you anything. He never really got the hang of the politics of academia or of the peer review system for scientific publishing. And he always remains a little bit of an outsider. And by the late 90s, he'd left the job with the Illinois Natural History Survey on what I gather were maybe not the friendliest terms. But this guy kept building radio systems for ornithologists in his garage right into the beginning of this century. Every time I give this talk for an audience of ornithologists, I hear more Bill Cochran stories. There's always someone in the audience who knew and worked with Bill and has another crazy story to share about him. I actually had the great good fortune to speak to Bill multiple times while I was researching my book and even to visit him at his home in Illinois where this station wagon was still in the driveway and most of his backyard was taken up with an enormous radio receiver tower. He was a hilarious character. He loved to screen his calls by pretending to be a janitor in an animal shelter when he answered the phone. So I would call him at a prearranged time for a phone interview and he'd pick up and say, hello, animal shelter, we're closed. And I'd just be sitting there going, Bill, is that you? So he was just a hoot. Sadly, Bill passed away in summer 2022 at the age of 90. I really believe that he is an unsung hero of 20th century science. And I'm happy that my book is hopefully going to make more people aware of all the things that he accomplished. So I'm reaching my last couple slides here. I'm almost done. Uh, in my last couple of minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about migratory bird conservation and why all of this matters so much. I did want to say briefly, I 
intentionally chose historical stories from the book for my talk, um, partly because, as I mentioned, I've given this talk for audiences of ornithologists, and I didn't want to find myself talking about someone who might be in the audience. That seemed pretty awkward. So if you get a chance to read the book, I promise the book is not all dead white guys, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, and I cover a lot of the more recent developments in the field as well, like the latest miniaturized tracking devices and artificial intelligence tools for analyzing big data sets, high volume genetic sequencing, all that sort of stuff. And thanks to all of these recent high tech advances, we now have a clearer and more detailed picture of bird migration than ever before, which is great because that data can help us target conservation efforts effectively something that is really important because migratory birds are not doing so great. So this is a paper that was published a few years ago, back in 2019. It generated quite a bit of media coverage when it came out and it was nicknamed the Three Billion Birds Paper because this large group of scientists came together and looked at data from a whole bunch of different sources and came up with this estimate that there are approximately 3 billion, with a B, fewer birds in North America now than there were in 1970. That's almost a 30% decline. It's just staggering. And so researchers and wildlife managers have been scrambling to figure out how to stop the bleeding. And as I was nearing the end of my book manuscript, I needed to write a conclusion and tie a bow on the whole thing somehow. And I decided that Part of how I wanted to do that was to tackle the question of whether some of these new tracking technologies might be part of the answer and whether there was any reason to feel hopeful when you look at numbers like this. And so I contacted a couple of the leading experts on migratory bird conservation today to ask them what they thought. I spoke to Pete Mara, who's one of the senior authors on this paper and co-founder of the Road to Recovery Initiative that grew out of it. And I also spoke with Jill Deppie, who's the director of the Audubon Society's Migratory Bird Initiative. And they had strikingly similar things to say. They agreed that despite all the ever more detailed migration research happening now, we still actually don't have enough data to know what's behind the declines of many of these individual species, because each species is different. They agree that there's a need to consolidate the data that is being collected and get it into the hands of policymakers and conservation activists to get better at working across international borders, to incorporate more, more partners in the social sciences and more perspectives from indigenous people. And somewhat to my surprise, they both insisted that yes, they feel hopeful about the future. So I'm gonna close by telling you what Pete Mara told me when I asked him if he feels optimistic when he goes into work every morning. He said, I'm very optimistic. We've done this in the past. We've corrected other environmental issues and now we have to deal with climate change. So while it seems like there's this overwhelming deluge of negative issues and challenges with getting people on board with these things and constant pressures on nature, I choose to be optimistic and hopeful just because I don't see any benefit of being pessimistic or having a lack of hope. I just don't choose to take that route. Don't get me wrong, there are times when I might be negative or spiraling down into a pit of agony, but I'm not gonna do that. I thought those were wise words and I don't know about all of you, but when I find myself spiraling down into a pit of agony, I usually just go burn it. So that is the end of my talk. Right here, this is my website, RebeccaHeisman.com. Um, obviously, I'm not there in person to sign anyone's books, and obviously, you can get a copy from the library. I, I love libraries, please do. But if anyone uh, feels moved to buy a copy of the book after hearing this talk and would like a signed book plate sticker to turn it into a signed book, you can email me via the contact form on my website. I would be happy to do that for you. The other thing you can find on my website is a link to sign up to my monthly email newsletter where I share not just what I'm working on, but interesting bird stories by other people, book recommendations, things like that. 